Oh, but maybe only one or two of you will have any idea what's wrong with what you're seeing right now. So, for the final regular episode of the year, I've got a very unusual game lined up for you guys, which technically isn't even a DOS game, as it was released on PC booter discs, both of which I still happen to have, as you can see right here. Yep, today's ancient DOS game is Raster Scan, one of the most unique, one of the most promising, and one of the most broken games out there. Yeah, Raster Scan started life as a cheap budget title and never really became anything more than that. In fact, when it made the transition from its European origins into PC and C64 ports for the North American market, things got even more broken. And as such, the game is still playable and winnable, but there's a lot more luck involved as a result. The manual, however, or rather the single page qualifying itself as a manual, was made before the game was finished, and has subtle references which make it seem as though there were much bigger plans for this game which simply never came to pass for whatever reason. This basically means there's little to say about the game itself, but part of the reason I've wanted to do this video is to give my impression as a game designer as to what this game could have been had they put more effort into it instead of releasing it as a budget title. Raster Scan was originally developed by John Pickford of Binary Design and published through Mastertronic for the Amstrad CPC and ZX Spectrum computers in 1987, with an MSX version following closely afterwards, then an updated port to the C64 and PC following in 1988, both of which were actually included on the same 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk, the idea being that you would flip the disk one way for PCs and flip it the other way for the C64. The closest approximation of the game's genre is, believe it or not, a puzzle game. And the PC version in particular supports CGA 4 color, Tandy 16 color, and EGA 16 color graphics, but only supports PC speaker sound, and is completely lacking in the music provided in other versions of the game. I should also note that there's some additional graphical bugs on top of the ones already present if you play in EGA mode, so the Tandy mode's the best way to go. As for its current release date, it was never made freeware, so it's technically still commercial, but finding legitimate copies of this thing is virtually impossible. Amidst all my searching, I only found a single copy on Amazon for $25, which included at least one disc and the manual, but not the box, nor was I able to figure out what platform it was for, given the stock screenshot, the mention of only one disc, and the insistence it was for the C64, when that disc also has the PC booter version on it as well. My guess is because of how incredibly rare yet incredibly unknown this game is, not to mention buggy and broken, copies shouldn't be too expensive on the off chance you happen to find one. There is actually a story to this game, as even the most simplest of games in the 80s had to have a story of some sort in them by law. Basically, some sort of accident has befallen a spaceship known as the Raster Scan, and it's stuck in space drifting towards a nearby star. Very few systems are still functioning, one of which happens to be a special robot known as the MSB, which probably stands for something, but is never revealed in-game or in the manual. I'm going to guess Maintenance System Ball, given that it's designed to perform maintenance, it's linked in with the ship's systems, and in original copies of the game, it was shaped like a beach ball, as opposed to the high-tech orb you're seeing now, not to mention bounces around like a ball. Only trouble is that the incident has left the MSB barely able to do anything at all. Its teleportation claws still function and it can interface with the ship's access switches, but that's about it. Thus, it's up to the player to guide the MSB throughout the ship to identify what's wrong, perform repairs, then try to navigate the ship away from the star and out of the sector to safety. By the way, one curious point of interest is that in original versions of this game, the graphics were substantially different. Instead of looking all high-tech, the ship layout and structure was much more abstract, with the switches looking like wrenches, wires looking like pipes, and again, the MSB looking like a beach ball. 
Raster Scan's gameplay is incredibly simple. You just move the MSB with the directional keys or a joystick and press enter or the fire button to interact with the world around you. That said, much of the challenge of the game is in simply trying to figure out what to do. The manual intentionally doesn't give you too much to go on, and there's extremely little feedback to the actions you perform, so it really is more like a large puzzle to figure out as opposed to being flat out told what you need to do to win. That said, the manual does provide a few points of interest, notably what specific goals you have to complete to win, and the order you probably want to complete them in. The first thing you need to do is get main power back online, as the backup battery for the ship isn't going to last very long, and if it dries up and all power fails, the MSB will go down too. The energy level is indicated by the yellow lightning bolt gauge at the bottom of the screen. The other two gauges are the blue fuel gauge and the red danger gauge. These mostly come into play later. So you start roaming around the ship, trying to figure out where everything is and why none of the switches seem to do anything. You notice a handful of broken wires in the process. Though eventually you'll figure out a few things, such as how the wires take a path from the main energy circuits, which form a closed loop, ending at an empty pipe, leading into one switch, then possibly another, then into an engine, of which there are four, one on each side of the ship. The main energy circuits are right next to the switch which turns main power on and off, but it doesn't work because there's a fuel leak on the outside of the ship that you need to fix first. To get the parts you need, though, you need to find the storage room which is locked off. Upon activating the switch to open the door, you'll be greeted with the first of the octagon puzzles. These puzzles are pretty simple. The colors are all shuffled around and you need to turn all eight segments yellow. The trick is that whenever you adjust one segment, one or two others will be adjusted as well. The methodology behind how the segments change can either be simple, flip-flopping between two specific states, or more complex, cycling between eight different states. There are five of these octagon puzzles, and they all behave differently, with the two puzzles using the more complex logic being extremely challenging if you're new to them. Though not so bad once you realize some of the tricks to them, such as how if you hit all eight segments once in any order, you'll have advanced all states by either two or three steps, depending on how many segments change at a time. Once you have access to the storage room, you can grab one of three parts. Pipes, horizontal wires, and vertical wires. Simply take a pipe section outside, repair the leak, head back in and activate the generator to stabilize main power and remedy the immediate threat. This will also activate the engine controls up in the top right section of the map, but you won't be able to adjust engine velocity until you fix specific engines in much the same way. The trick with the engines, though, is that each has two switches to toggle and they're scattered around the ship. And once you have at least one engine fixed, you can start moving and potentially win the game, but it really depends on where all the obstacles in the sector are, which you won't know about until you activate the scanner, which is right by the engine controls. The scanner is activated by toggling the first and third switches in the room above, but you still won't see anything on the scanner because, well, this port clearly wasn't finished. The scanner will actually show you your ship's position within the sector, but only if the MSB is passing over top. In completed versions of this game, the scanner would also show the nearby star and planets. So since you can't see where you're going, and since the danger level gauge is busted in this version of the game, once you're ready to move, you're just going to have to set your acceleration level to something and hope for the best. Normally, the danger level is supposed to represent your proximity to dangerous stellar objects and is also increased by the fuel leak while it's present, as well as by having the airlock open. The airlock and fuel states are read properly by the danger gauge, but nothing else. If danger gets too high, the ship breaks apart and the game ends. The fuel gauge comes into play once you get your acceleration going, as you'll probably burn slightly less than half of your fuel by the time you reach the edge of the sector. But if your fuel runs out, the game also ends. A couple last things to mention is that the game actually has the ability to save and load, which is done from a room with a very narrow looking cassette tape deck inside of it, seeing as how the game was originally released on cassette tape. But it's also important to note that it's impossible to get the downward engine working in this version of the game as the broken wire locations are fewer and different from the original release. But one of them has been placed behind the generator fuel connection pipes, which you were supposed to have access to with the generator off, but it's impossible to get back there as the hit detection for this is never properly updated. I can safely say that Raster Scan, in its current state, is not the game John Pickford originally envisioned, and there's a huge number of subtleties which tie into this, so let's go over some of them. 
The first is that the manual actually points out a map symbol which is never used in the game itself to indicate asteroid impacts. The original concept for the game probably had you navigating through an asteroid field. If the game was ultimately made this way, it would have made the whole maneuvering thing more challenging. And not to mention it would have made it much more important to fix all four engines, and it would have made fuel levels far more important. Not to mention, unlike planets or the sun which destroy you instantly, the asteroids could simply do damage, knocking out a chunk of hull, breaking some wires in random spots, maybe even pipes. I'm very convinced this was all the part of the original plan for this game, even though there's nothing I can find to substantiate this theory. Another aspect of the game which helps verify this idea, though, is the storage room. It has three barrels in it for pipes, horizontal wires, and vertical wires. However, given that it would have been possible for the hull to take hits and get breached if there were asteroids to dodge, I think the original plan for the barrel components were pipes, wires, and hull plating. The other thing, too, is the saving and loading mechanic. This is a really short game, beatable in under 15 minutes once you know exactly what to do, so having saving and loading feels pointless. But if the game was more dynamic and more involved, having saving and loading would suddenly make a whole lot more sense. There's a couple other things, too, which could have made this game even more fun. The first would have been having the initial leaks and wire cuts in random locations each time you play, thus giving at least a little bit of variety to initially fixing the ship. Also, many of the switches act as state toggles, meaning they get switched between on and off, but there's no feedback as to what state they're actually in. So having that feedback would have helped reduce player frustration while trying to solve the logic of getting the ship to safety. Lastly, this game would have benefited hugely from randomized ship layouts, but given when this game was made, that kind of gameplay would have been exceptionally tricky to pull off. So that's more something that someone would want to do if they ever remade this game. I don't think the thoughts never crossed my mind. Raster Scan 2, with randomly generated ships, asteroids, and a more traditional movement system since bouncing around like a ball isn't fun when you're under threat of constant asteroid collisions. You know, if I ever got permission to make such a thing, I'd definitely be tempted to go for it. So, for as nostalgic as this game is for me, and as much as I enjoy the potential it had, Let's face it, overall, Raster Scan pretty much sucks, especially the PC and C64 ports, which have more bugs than the originals. Still, I see the essence of a great game buried underneath the rushed and untested mess that you've been watching, and I would love to see this game make a modern comeback with major improvements, either through my own efforts or the efforts of someone else. As it stands, though, it's just an interesting piece of gaming history with little reason to play it nowadays, short of nostalgia, due to its bugs, simplicity, and lack of any replay value. Now, because this is a PC booter game, if you have access to an original disc, and you need to first make a disc image of it, then use DOSBox's boot command to load and boot from that disc image. To be honest though, I don't know the particulars of making this work, as my main computer doesn't have a floppy drive, so I resorted to downloading a version of the game which had been converted to run in DOS. Not properly though, so I had to scout around more to find a patch so that I can make said download work under DOSBox. But I'm just saying that that kind of stuff is out there if you want to work around to trying to get the booter disks working. As for DOSBox settings, you need to set cycles to a very low fixed value to get the game to play at a decent speed. I used a setting of 250 cycles, while setting the game speed itself to 1 when starting it. Joystick support also works without extra configuration, though I personally recommend keyboard controls simply because of how this game plays. And that's all for episode 175 of Ancient DOS Games. Season 4 ain't over yet though, but it's time for me to take my usual annual break from the show to focus on other projects and save myself from video making burnout. That said, I'll have a filler video next Saturday to give you all an idea of what to expect over the next couple months, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And again, many thanks to all of you for continuing to watch the show and for pledging your support to me, either indirectly, simply by spreading the word, or directly through monetary contributions through Patreon. We still have at least another 25 episodes of ADG to go for 2016, and I have some epic stuff planned for episode 200 exactly one year from now. Not to mention a slew of popular and lesser known titles to get to still. Basically, there's lots more to do, and I hope you all stick around to see where everything goes.